Well, hi everybody. My name is Carl Sandoval, and uh, as you can see, I've got a uh, photograph of uh, myself and Edward Van Halen in our younger days. And I just wanted to say that uh, this video hopefully will be inspiring to all my viewers. That will be a video concerning the uh, contribution that I made to the black with yellow striped Strat that I was very instrumental in uh, working with when I was uh, working with um, Wayne Charvel way back in the early days in the first building uh, industrial building that Wayne Charvel uh, had uh, uh, rented now I'm going to plainly indicate here, if you look at behind our heads, you'll see a bay door. And this photograph was taken in front of the first building that Wayne Charvel got into. It was about a thousand square feet in San Dimas. And uh, of course I was the head man working there. And... Um, I, I've I've read some other places where people were saying that this guitar was presented to Eddie at some festival concert or I don't know, you know. And I I'll tell you, man. I, I just wanted to point out, you know, be careful what you believe when you read articles. Um, you know, if you want the truth, go to the source, or check out my videos on my social media, and where I was and who I dealt with. Is the honest truth as you can see in this photograph there's no lie about this photograph and with the bay door backdrop there you can plainly see that it was not taken at a concert it was actually like I say in front of our first industrial building that we had there in St. Dimas but um, I remember this guitar quite well because uh, it was towards my latter part in working with Wayne in 1979 and uh, so this guitar I was very like I was saying earlier I was very instrumental in getting it uh, uh, all together now before I continue on I just like to point out uh, you know thank you for all you uh, YouTube viewers uh, if you're not uh, subscribed to my channel please do so. Uh, you will see a variety of these videos uh, with my experiences with these rock artists that were that made it pretty big. Uh, this photo here happens to be of uh, Carl Sandoval, myself, and Edward Van Halen. And uh, so, uh, yeah, by all means, subscribe to my YouTube channel, subscribe to my uh, Patreon channel, which will financially help me out. That's a, a monthly prescription. It's only $5. For the amount of information and the entertainment you're going to see, it's well worth the $5 monthly fee. Um, this isn't just a one-shot video you're going to see. You're going to see many, so it's definitely worth the subscription. Um, also, you can check me out on Instagram, uh, my Facebook. Uh, I have a website. And if you'd like to make a small donation or a contribution to keep these videos going, that's where the money goes. By all means, uh, do so on my PayPal account, which is with a K, letter K, Carl at CarlSandoval.com. I spell my first name with the letter K. That's Carl at CarlSandoval.com. All right, let's proceed in uh, giving you information about this guitar. Back at that particular period, it was uh, just right after the uh, old Charvel shop that we had on uh, Arrow and Azusa, and um, that was in uh, uh, Covina, Covina, California, and uh, Wayne was outgrowing this facility that he was in. It was small, and it was kind of like away from the road. It was out, <coughs> excuse me, it was out down into a little... Uh, area there and um, he needed something a little more appropriate and a little more 
sustainable for uh, industrial equipment such as overarm routers and larger band saws and to be able to store wood and all that and this was the building that we found you really can't see much of it here only the opening but this is where a lot of the magic took place and uh, we were we were beginning the reason we, why we wanted to get into this industrial building was that we wanted to start manufacturing our own bodies and necks and other parts it was small. It was only a thousand square feet, but nonetheless, it was a beginning, and it was, it was really great to have. Um, sorry about the dimming there. I'm, I'm on my, I'm got this camera right on my computer, and I, I neglected to move the, the mouse to keep it lit up. But anyway, so yeah, we wanted to have a facility for spray painting with a spray booth and the, you know, uh, small and light manufacture of bodies and necks. Some of the bodies and necks that we were getting at that time were from uh, Boogie Bodies up north. Wayne had a friend named Lynn Ellsworth and uh, he was very uh, helpful in, in, in uh, getting us getting us uh, bodies and necks. And But it was like everything like was in a transition period and uh, of course Eddie Van Halen got a hold of us and he requested a strat, a single humbucking strat. Uh, it was a maple fingerboard and uh, Back in the day, he liked the jumbo frets. Uh, this happened to be a maple fingerboard. Um, I'm, I don't think it was. There was a finish on it. There could have been a black finish on the back of the neck. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at the headstock, if there was no finish on the back of the head, the right there on the top of the headstock where the tuners are, that would be maple colored. But it's showing black, so I'm, I'm pretty certain that we had a black, black black paint that was. Uh, painted on the back of the neck um, that would be the evidence right there uh, all chrome hardware and uh, it was you know a fender style bridge and uh, a black humbucker now what you see there is the very first black with yellow striped strat that was built for Edward Van Halen I did all the assembly on it meticulously uh, I was trained and then experienced in, in through many, many hours, painstaking hours uh, from previous guitars. And so in working on this guitar, you know, it, it came pretty easy to me. When you do something long enough, you, became, you become proficient at it. But uh, six inline tuners, they could have been either uh, mini shellers or goto. Um, the... Uh, the nut could have been bone or brass if you look closely. Uh, you know, now, now when I assembled this guitar, I was always meticulous about how I worked. I would blow off the area quite frequently if I did any dremeling or filing or sanding of any kind in, in assembling the guitar, especially getting the paint around the neck pocket. That is a very, very crucial area of being careful to, to get the paint inside the paint, uh, the neck pocket very uh, carefully with files and sandpaper and and you wanted to make a, uh, a, a, a an etched surface there so the neck wouldn't shift. This would be a four bolt bolt-on strat of course but uh, like installing installing the tuners I would use a hand reamer and carefully uh, take away any paint away from a hole, which would be the tuner holes. Uh, also, in drilling any type of a hole that would take a screw, I would drill the hole with a small, small uh, drill bit, and then I would countersink it with a small little countersink to spread the paint away from uh, the hole area, and then you know I would proceed to either enlarge it or leave it the same. It was it, it depend on the size of screw that we use, was used during the assembly. Um, there was a procedure in how I cleaned out the nut slot, what type of uh, files I used, and protection. So, you know, you, you really had to be careful about handling the guitar with a finish like this. Nitrocellulose lacquer, it may have had a polyester base coat, but then above that would be uh, nitrocellulose lacquer. That would be the colors. The, the the yellow and then then it was taped and then black was sprayed and then the clear was put over that and leveled off 
to where you wouldn't feel the lumps of the uh, where the tape was placed but you really had to be careful and I used to think of these guitars as being like crystal uh, meaning I mean just the slightest pressure put against that paint you could create a chip and so meticulously I got the holes cleaned out for the tuners I got those on I drilled the holes for the set screw and I uh, didn't bear down on the tuner because it would crush the finish and and sometimes we would paint so quickly or you have to get a guitar done if we tighten the tuners down too much it would bubble up the paint would kind of expand a little bit around the washer where the hex nut was and tightening down the tuner so once again it was meticulously just using a hex nut driver just barely 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 getting a snug fit that with the set screw would hold the tuner in place and then I used fret files of course uh, with the uh, 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 narrow file slot tar part of the blade to, to cut each particular slot now like I say these were done precisely uh, you obviously would have a narrower slot cut for the height uh, E string which was probably a 9 uh, and then the low the low E string which would have been what in the 40s like mid 40s but um, you know they were cut to size for each size of string gauge that was used for this particular guitar um, all the parts on it were pretty standard, you know, four hole neck plate, the strap buttons were very small. And uh, I just want to make a point here that some of this stuff was changed later on. So I'm taking a guitar like Crystal and I put it together meticulously. It was highly buffed out. When he received it, it was like a jewel. It was glossy. Wayne Charvel was really good at spraying his... His, um, I used to do a lot of the polyester base coat application and then Wayne would come and he would pretty much just do, do the spraying of the colors whether it be black, yellow, whatever color, sunburst and he would have myself do like you know apply the, the tape or we would work together on situations like that but ultimately he shot all the final coats and then I had to wet sand it in between coats and wet sand it prior to the buffing and then I had to buff it out with a uh, these were done by hand. We had no stand-up buffers at the time. So if you could picture a right-angled, uh, uh, two-handled, uh, like a car buffer with different degrees of pads that we would use. We would use the a paste with a cutter grit, uh, at, you know, to do the rough cut. And then we would use, uh, like, Meguiar's, diluted Meguiar's, uh, the green uh, or the pale uh, uh, like eggshell colored uh, wax uh, that was in a bottle but I remember it being Meguiar's and uh, you know they were buffed out uh, meticulously and, and then very carefully taken over to the assembly bench I remember that bench I mean it's like I have visions in my mind about where the tools were uh, the drills that were used the files the screwdrivers any type of a chisel, sandpaper, sanding blocks, custom jigs, and, and uh, literally this guitar, you know, it wasn't, you know, they're, they're put together by hand, but a proficient hand. And this is after many, many hours of training from Wayne Charvel and just experiences in working with other guitars. Um, so, you know, all the holes, like I say, that were drilled uh, for the four holes that hold the neck plate on they were countersunk the holes drilled for the strap buttons they were countersunk the right dimension hole was drilled um, to accommodate the, the size of screw and then another important important point was how that bridge was put on if you don't put on those six screws that hold hold the bridge in place it's the pivot point then if they're offset you could have a binding problem which would be a tuning problem um, so, uh, you can see that, uh, in this photograph, we're, we're pretty young. Um, I think I was in my, uh, we were both in our early twenties. Uh, it, it, I was a little, a few years older than, than Ed, but we had long hair. It was dark. 
and uh, we were thinner, you know, you know, you know, you're wearing like size 26, size 28 pants, you know, because your waistline is so, so uh, thin, but um, it was a pretty unique experience in, in getting this guitar set up, and, and uh, so I was also involved in setting the action, adjusting the truss rod, adjusting the pickup, setting the intonation, doing the electronics. As you can see, there's no top mount cup jack. It had a side mount uh, Les Paul jack, no doubt made out of uh, 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 brass that was chrome plated, because it has all chrome hardware on it. It had a string retainer on it, but Eddie wasn't one for string retainers. He liked to have the string straight from the nut to the pulp to the tuning post, uh, as straight as possible. And um, this was a non-locking system, a non-locking strat, which you know, there's an art form that the professional players used to uh, do in setting these guitars up to play in tune. It's not an easy bridge to, to keep in tune. Typically, you know, if you're doing a lot of dive bombing in the early days, you would set the, the block flat to the body. Uh, there was a procedure in keeping these strats in tune, and, and basically... That's tuning up, making sure your strings are stretched. Very, very important. A lot of musicians don't do that very well. And so then they end up having tuning problems. And ultimately, you know, they start complaining about the manufacturer of the guitar. But, you know, guitar players need to take some initiative to really um, develop their own personal skills and how they work an instrument, especially a guitar with uh, a floating tremolo bridge. So... Once your strings are stretched out, you incorporate the tuning along with dive bombs and hitting that tremolo arm real quick. And it would kind of give you a, a balanced string tension. Now granted, this is just one method. There are many. And I'm only one concept of how guitars are built. I never ever claim that I know it all and that the way I do it is the way and the only way. No, so please don't get offended. There are other luthiers out there that are, are fantastic and they do great work and I give them all the credit and in, in their abilities and every, but everybody basically has their own magic and what they put into a, a strat but as we all know Eddie did quite well with his unlocking systems and uh, but when he was presented this guitar in San Dimas not at a rock concert it was meticulously beautiful, highly polished, highly glossy, and uh, now the next thing that, that I'm going to tell you was real shocking for me because he got the guitar in a new case and all, and uh, he left. And uh, we saw him, it wasn't too much longer after that, he came back and wanted some other minimal things done, done to the guitar, and, and when I saw it, <laughs> when he brought it back, I was in shock. I was in total shock because the guitar was on its way or in the middle of just being Van Halenized, so to speak, where it was in a case that was full of miscellaneous parts and tools and screwdrivers and pliers, and it was all scuffed up. It was just set on a bunch of whatever, uh, uh, Eddie was really not one for, uh, I'm sure he had his, his meticulous collectibles, but certain guitars he would just play, they were functional guitars, he took the, uh, so it was all scuffed up and scratched and chipped, and you can tell he was working on it on his own, which is fine, you know, no, I mean, that's just the way uh, life goes on, and that was just Ed, Edward Van Halen, he put these eye hooks for strap buttons which would clip onto a some sort of a seat belt and that was his strap setup so just picture enlarged holes with two uh, eye bolts where you'd have the regular strap buttons and they would hook on to a clip that hooked onto a seat belt strap and uh, the pickup was changed later on and uh, the electronics was pretty basic. There really wasn't much he could do there other than just changing pickups. And uh, he was one for experimenting with with a variety of different humbuckers and the different types of magnets and switching coils. And 
and uh, so what you see there it's a black pickup now specifically uh, we used a lot of Seymour Duncans and we used a lot of DiMarjos back then so we'd have to look real real close to see which model of pickup that was but nonetheless in, in my opinion either one of those pickups were fantastic um, it was just a single volume uh, which would, would have been a 500k potentiometer, uh, um, an audio taper potentiometer, uh, either with a solid or split shaft, of course. And then the, 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 the Oppa jack would have been a quarter inch switchcraft jack. And, um, you know, the, the tremolo arm was just a typical tremolo, tremolo arm, like a basic fender type design that just hung there. And uh, if you look closely, it could have had either brass or uh, uh, regular fender style tremolo uh, uh, inserts the oh shoot I'm, I'm losing my my memory here on what that was what those are called but um, the saddles are called saddles bridge saddles for each string and uh, you know really it, it it's just a matter of of like what was there at the time and what we used to use and we used to combine chrome with brass there was an era there where brass parts were just like the thing and, and I particularly didn't like that because an all brass guitar corroded down the line and they looked horrible they, that that was really a you know brass after a while it turns green and copper colored and dark like a, a dark grayish look and all that and you know corrosion from the or, or the palm of your hand especially if it was on saddles and what was bad about it was brass would corrode so bad that the string height adjustment screws would would lock in place and you couldn't get couldn't get them loose and of course that would happen with the old pot metal type fender style bridges at, you know just the same but but as you can see there definitely was a tremolo non-locking six headline tuners and you know sometimes the minimal winds on the pull piece on the uh, post for the tuners was was incorporated to help aid in uh, keeping these types of um, guitars in tune. Another thing that was done when, when the guitar came back, each each uh, slot that was cut for the strings was no longer precisely cut for each size of guitar string. It looked like they were all cut out with like the smallest bass guitar string uh, size of file. And what this did was allow along with oil or graphite being put on the nut it allowed just one surface point which would be the very bottom of the string creating contact on that string nut and if you didn't cut that nut right where the pinnacle point left at the furthest end of the nut towards the bridge you would end up with a sitar sound and so you needed some pressure there from the nut to the tuning post and uh, Ed was was one into and I, I think you know think about it. I mean we all know how he played his tremolos He played them very well and so he uh, Cut those string slots big and I mean to most typical old-school guitar player uh, guitar luthiers that would be just a no-no, but and he used to go against the grain a lot, and you know, rightfully so. I mean, <laughs> no complaints about that because listen to him play, listen to his recordings. The guy was phenomenal. I used to see him live, and my jaw would just drop at his abilities and what he used to do. Oh, there we go with the fade again. Uh, the guy was just incredible, and uh, his through his experimentation, <coughs> excuse me, he came up with a perfect. Uh, perfect way to set up his guitars to uh, incorporate his style of playing so you know so uh, you know this guitar was was pretty unique and I was very fortunate to be there at the right time and be very instrumental in its build and and uh, I would just like to say one more time you know be careful about these chat lines and forums and all these things that you hear about you know uh, certain guitars from rock stars and you know I, I read some of this stuff and you know that's one of the reasons why I don't like to get on these forums and chat lines and I've been asked quite a few times but it's because it's like an open forum for a bunch of garbage I'm sorry it, it's just what it is people 
you know, if you line up 25 people and, and you start with person number one and you say the guitar was black and yellow, by the time it got to the end, uh, somebody will say, and it'll ultimately get to, well, oh, the guitar was gray with light blue stripes. You know, that, that's just human nature. And uh, But, you know, I, I some of the stuff that I read, I'm, I'm just like, the public is mis misled so many times. And uh, so beware, be careful. Uh, just take what you read with a grain of salt. And if you ever really want to know information, go to extreme reliable sources. Go to the original source and get facts. Uh, don't listen and believe a friend of a friend of a friend. I mean, I'm telling you, man, I, I've heard so many, so many wrong points of interest that I don't know. I guess people just want to be heard. They they want to be part of the the uh, the the uh, or a witness of of the reality of what really went on back then, you know. And I've had some people claim that they were there during incidents that they obviously were not. But you know, people are people. They're what well, they're what they are, and we just kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. But anyway, that's going to end this video. I hope you get you find this to be enjoyable and entertaining because that's all that's all it really is and there's a lot of fact here you're hearing it straight from the guy who actually put the guitar together I'm not a rumor I'm not just a guy that jumped on the bandwagon recently no evidence is through this photograph I was there I built I helped uh, a tremendous amount in the contribution of getting this guitar finalized and, and if you hear of anything else you know well <laughs> you make the call whether you want to believe it or not but with that being said I just want to say thank you so much and more videos to come God bless